begin with prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us another opportunity to come together as a people to study thy word. We ask for your presence with us. May your Holy Spirit guide us as we seek your truth from scripture to scripture and that we'll be ready when the time comes when probation closes. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, if you were asked to give a Bible study on the close of probation, how would you do it? I know there are many approaches to this subject, but this morning, we're going to focus on the teachings of Jesus in the Gospels. And I'm going to share some statements from the Spirit of Prophecy just to reinforce what we're learning from the Bible. So are you ready? Let's turn our Bibles now to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. A very familiar passage for us as a Seventh-day Adventist church, but we're going to read again some of the familiar scriptures. Now, all the way in chapter 24, as you know, Jesus has been describing all the different signs of his second coming. And then when you come down to verse 36, okay, Matthew 24, verse 36, Jesus says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So we don't know exactly which day or hour Jesus is coming back. But, again in 37, there's another but. Jesus said, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So here, Jesus gives us a hint. The end of the world is going to be like the days of Noah. And then verse 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. Now, this day that Noah entered into the ark, what happened? What event took place on that day? The door shut. 120 years of probation closed on that day. Now, did the people realize that? No, because if you go back and read verse 39, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, the close of probation, as described by Jesus here, is shut door. But people living on this earth did not know when the probation closed. Until the destruction came, the flood came, and took them all away. Now, here Jesus kind of sets the foundations. He sets the stage. And Jesus gives six more parables after this. In other <coughs> words, after he lays the foundation, he repeats and adds a little bit more details each time. In other words, repeat and enlarge. Just like the way we study the prophecies, in the books of Daniel and Revelation. So Jesus kind of builds more and more, adding more information until we get the whole picture of how we are to watch and wait for the second coming. So let's continue in verse 40 and 41. The first parable that he tells. Verse 40 says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. 
Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. I know when I was growing up in Sunday church, they always used this scripture to、um, say that, oh, there will be a secret rapture. But we know that's not what Jesus meant here. So we see two people working in the field, right? And two women also working. Who are they? Apparently, those two look the same. There's no apparent difference until the time came when was taken away by what? Okay, we have to look at the context. Just previous to that, we know that people living in Noah's day were taken away by the flood. So one is taken away by destruction. And the other is left. That means one remains remnant to be saved. One is taken away by destruction, the other one remains as a remnant to be delivered, to be saved. So, do we see here two people, two kinds of people? Who are these people? They're working in the field. That means they are. Not unbelievers, but they are God's professed people working in the field, doing service for God. But then there are two groups. They don't know when provision closes until one is taken away by destruction at the end of the world, not by flood, but by what? Fire when Jesus comes. The other one remains. Remnant to be saved. Do we see the picture emerging? Two groups of people, professed people of God, one destroyed, one remained as the remnant. Now that's why in verse 42, Jesus says, Watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. Okay, so we saw two groups of professed people, no apparent difference. Just like in Noah's day, they didn't know when the provision closed and the door shut until the destruction came. One destroyed and one remained as a remnant to be saved. That's why Jesus is saying, Watch, it will be too late if you wait until that time when the destruction comes. And then the next story he builds a little bit more again, verse 43. Verse 43 says, But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now, how does the thief come? Does the thief announce, this, Oh, I'm coming to your house tonight? No. How does the thief come? He comes silently, unnoticed, at the time when you're not expecting, right? Coming of the thief. What hour is this? Many people believe it's the second coming. Is that right? Now, if you go back to verse 26 and 27 in the same chapter, chapter 24, 26 and 27, where Jesus says, Wherefore, if they, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Before, behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, does that coming sound like a thief? No, it's going to be like a lightning from the east to west. Remember, John said, Every eye shall see him coming in the clouds of heaven. That's not coming of like a thief, right? So, what is Jesus teaching here? Coming of the Son of Man like a thief. Remember what we already learned from the Noah's day? Did people know when the door shut? 
No. Like a thief coming when we are sleeping, we don't know. This is talking about the close of probation again, not the coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven. So coming of Jesus suddenly, silently, unnoticed, when you're least expecting, that's close of probation. Now let's look at next story. In verses 45 through 51, it's a long passage. We're not going to read every verse. But this is a master who left two groups of servants in charge of his household. And then in verse 50, this master comes home suddenly. Let's read verse 50. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of. This master's sudden unexpected coming, is it the second coming? Or is it the close of probation? See, we already learned from previous stories, the unexpected coming is not the second coming in the clouds of heaven, but it is the close of probation. Do you see how Jesus is building with more and more information, with different stories? And then when the master comes, there are two groups of people again. One group, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Okay, giving of meat. One group. Jesus calls them faithful and wise servant, providing food, providing spiritual food, providing the word of God, providing truth to the household of God in the church. They're providing truth from the word of God. They're doing their work faithfully, and not only in the church, but to the people outside because Everyone in the world, they are God's children. So they are being faithful workers. But what about the other group? Verse 48. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. So there's another group of people, professed people of God. Well, this evil servant said, My Lord delayeth his coming. Did he say it out loud? In his heart. So, if he heard the sermon, Jesus is coming soon, this servant would have said, Amen. He professed to believe in the soon coming of Jesus, the return of the Master. But he said in his heart. In other words, he did not live what he professed to believe. His daily life didn't show that he really believed that the coming was soon. And what did he do instead in verse 49? He began to smite his fellow servants. He was putting them down, criticizing, condemning, judging. And what else he was doing? To eating to eat and drink with the drunken. We know this means spiritual drunkenness. How do we get drunk spiritually? You drink the wines of Babylon. And Babylon represents the world, the worldliness. So even though this evil servant professed to believe in the coming of Jesus, his life showed that he was into the world, worldliness. He had pride, because pride is the essence of what Babylon stands for. And then, of course, wines. Wines of Babylon, false teaching. And do you see the two groups in this parable? And what's the consequence of this evil servant not waiting and watching and working for the master? Verse 51 and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. Too late, too late. The probation had closed. It was too late for him to do anything about it. And we're going to talk about weeping and gnashing of teeth a little later. So here in this parable again, the emphasis is on close observation, how there will be two groups among God's people. And the question is, are we living what we profess to believe? Now, the next story is a very familiar story, a parable of ten virgins. And we're just going to go quickly through the story. Now, there's a cry made at midnight in verse 6. In okay, Matthew 25 now, Matthew 25, this is a continuation of Jesus' sermon. This is all continuing now. In verse 6, And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. The question is, which coming is this? Is it the second coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven? Or something else? Remember, we already learned a lot of things previous to this, right? All the parables, beginning with Noah's days. Now let's go to verse 10. Remember the five foolish virgins, they were not ready. They didn't have the oil, so they went out to buy some oil. And then verse 10, when wild, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. What we learned previously, when the, there's a shut door, what does that indicate? Provision closed. Yes, closing of provision. This is not the coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven, as many people believe. Now here I'm going to read some statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. The book Great Controversy, page 428. Great Controversy 428. It's a chapter titled, In the Holy of Holies. So the focus of the whole chapter is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, I'm going to quote, When the work of invest investigation shall be ended, when the cases of those who in all ages have professed to be followers of Christ have been examined and decided, then, and not till then, probation will close, and the door of mercy will be shut. Thus, in one short sentence, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. We are carried down through the Savior's final ministration to that time when the great work of man's salvation shall be completed. Did you see the door shut, probation closing? When did Jesus' final ministration begin? In the most holy place. In 1844. And all the way until the close of probation. So in one sentence, the whole period is described in Matthew 25, verse 10. It's amazing. The final ministration of Jesus in the most holy place is described in just one short sentence. And then in the same book, Great Controversy 393, we're told that ten virgins represent Adventist people. It had an application back in the pioneers' time. But she says it also represents, the ten virgins represent the church living in the last days. That's you and I. We're that ten virgins. Now, in verse 10, we're told that those who are ready, in other words, the wise virgins who are ready went in with him to the marriage. 
Where is this place? Where? When the door shut. Marriage. Going into the marriage. We said that the last phase of Jesus' ministration was going on since 1844, right? We call that the Day of Atonement. Atonement, that means at one meant. Coming together. Atonement, marriage. A union of Christ and his people. That's been taking place in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. In the same book, Great Controversy 427, she says very clearly that the marriage takes place in heaven while we are still on earth. In other words, we go into the most holy place by faith. We're going to enter the most holy place by faith. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this marriage later on. Now, many people confuse this marriage with the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, marriage supper of the Lamb takes place in heaven after the second coming. From Revelation 19, verse 9, the marriage supper takes place. It's a celebration, like a banquet. From Revelation 19, verse 9, marriage supper takes place in heaven after the second coming. But the marriage is taking place in the most holy place right now, since 1844. Please do not, do not confuse the two, the marriage and the marriage supper. Okay? Now, what happens when the door is shut? What do the foolish versions do? Open, open for us. You know why? Because they thought they deserve to be admitted. How come? Please, let us in. But it was too late. Too late. A shut door. So this closer provision is not the coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven, but coming out of the most holy place in heavenly sanctuary to get ready to come down to this earth. Yes, coming out of the most holy place. So again, we see two groups, the wise and the foolish virgins. Apparently, there's no difference until the call comes until the provision closes and then it's too late. The door is shut. And it's amazing how Jesus responds to this cry, please open to us. In verse 12, I say unto you, I know you not. Now we're going to talk about this word know a little bit later again, so Hold on. Why did Jesus say such a thing? I mean, Jesus knows every one of us. Why did he say, I don't know you? So that's another thing we're going to talk about a little later. But he said in verse 13, watch. He's repeating the word, watch. Therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. We don't know when Jesus actually comes in the clouds of heaven. We don't know when Jesus comes out of the most holy place. Neither one. We don't know. But we need to watch and work and wait faithfully. Now the next two parables, you know them well. We're not going to go through them, but from verse 14 through 30 is a parable of the talents. Three different kinds of servants. So Jesus is telling us exactly how we are to watch and wait by using our talents for the Lord's work. Okay, don't just put it away. You have to use your talents. And then to, on verse 30, just look, let's look at verse 30. What happens to the wicked and slothful servant? In verse 30 of Matthew 25, 
it says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Same description of that servant who was not faithful to the Lord. Again, we see two kinds of people, right? They're all given the talent. Two of them worked hard for the Lord, but one did not. And then the last story here is the story of the sheep and the goat. Exactly how to work is described here. And actually, we're learning that in our Sabbath school lesson this quarter. The gospel in the community is how we are to help others, how we are to minister to the needy. And we're already learning that. So this whole discourse, that, that sermon that Jesus taught to his disciples just before his crucifixion, do you know why Jesus repeats this, this concept of being ready? Watch and wait over and over and over because probation close, is going to close when you don't know, when you're not aware of. It's a vital thing to know, to be ready and watching at any time. That's why Jesus is repeating so often. And you see that in other Gospels too, which we're going to look at a couple more. Okay, so this concept of close observation is throughout the Gospels. It's not something that we find here and there. It's all the way in the teachings of Jesus. So let's look at the book of Mark this time. Mark 13. Mark chapter 13. We're going to look at verse 32. Mark chapter 13. And verse 32, where again Jesus repeats that we don't know the day in the hour when Jesus will come back. And then verse 33, Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for you know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Do you see the repetition again? Okay. And verse 35, Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Talk about repetition. Really, Jesus is emphasizing. Now, I'm going to share a passage from the Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, pages 190 to 191. That's 2T, 190 to 191. It's a chapter titled, Worldliness in the Church. Worldliness in the Church. Remember being drunken? Okay. And then she emphasizes watchfulness while we're waiting. And I'm going to uh, quote the next sentence. Now, she quotes Mark 13, 35 and 36. We just read together. And she begins with a question. What time is here referred to? Not to the revelation of Christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep. No. But to his return from his ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. When he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with garments of vengeance. And when the mandate goes forth, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You know that that's from Revelation 22, verse 11. You see the two groups. 
Again here, two groups of people formed at the close of probation. Now these are the words of Jesus at the close of probation. What about the action of Jesus? Jesus says these words, but action of Jesus at the close of probation. You know the verse from Daniel 12.1? You don't have to turn to it. Daniel 12.1 says, And at that time, meaning at the close of probation, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, Thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. And then that book, we know that it's a book of life. Book of life of the Lamb. So here we see in Daniel 12, Michael standing up. Whenever the Bible uses the word Michael for Jesus, it's a battle scene in a great controversy. Even in Revelation 12, 7, where it says there was war in heaven. Remember, Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. So whenever there's a battle, battle scene, the name Michael is used for Jesus. So Michael is going to stand up, stand for the children of thy people. In other words, he's going to stand up as an advocate, our defense. And at that time... God's people will be delivered. So close of probation is a good news for God's people because it's a time of deliverance. As long as your name is found in the book of life, deliverance starts for those who follow the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus was crucified... He was resurrected on the third day, and then he ascended to heaven okay, 40 days later. How does the Bible describe Jesus? According to Hebrews 1.3, Jesus sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus sat down. But when provision closes, he's going to stand up. Whenever there is a change in the movement of Jesus, it signals a significant event in heaven. So Jesus was sitting, but then he's going to stand up. There was another occasion we see recorded in the Bible. Remember Stephen, who was stoned? He saw a vision just before he died. You can read about this later in Acts chapter 7, verses 55 to 56. Stephen saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Why? Instead of sitting on the right hand of God, Jesus was standing. Stoning of Stephen. That took place in 34 A.D. What was the significance of that event? It was the close of probation for Israel as a nation, according to the 70-week prophecy of Daniel 9. As Adventists, we should know all these prophecies. 34 AD, when Stephen was stoned, that signaled the close of probation for Israel as a nation, the end of the 70 week prophecy. That's why Jesus was standing up as an advocate for his people. We're going to look at one more story in Luke 13. We're going to go to the next book, Luke 13. Luke chapter 13. We read together as a scripture reading in verses 24 and 25. In Luke 13, 24 and 25. But if you look at verse 23, 
One of the disciples asked a question in verse 23, where it says, Lord, are there few that be saved? Okay, in answer, in response to that question, Jesus answers in verses 24 and 25. So let's read 24 again. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Do you see the similarities from the other parables that we already looked at? Do you see the shut door? That's the close of probation. Do you see the master of house, the house Rising up, standing up? Yes. Now, who are these people who are outside of the door? Knocking, please open unto us. What kind of people? Verse 26. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Now, these people who are standing outside the door, they're not unbelievers because they ate the word of God. They drank the water of life. They heard the teaching of Jesus. But what happened in verse 27? I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. See, these people are God's people. They're in the church. Sabbath after Sabbath, listening to the, the word of God. Listening to the gospel being preached. And yet they're rejected as workers of iniquity. And what happens as a result in verse 28? There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, we see the same phrase. Too late. Too late for repentance. No matter how much they cry and weep and ask to be admitted. Jesus says, I'm sorry, I don't know where you're from. They were knocking, they were asking because they thought they deserve to be admitted. They didn't realize why, what crime did they commit? What did they do? Or shall I say, what did they fail to do? If you go back to verse 24, Jesus says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. They did not enter. They did not choose to enter in at the straight gate. So where is this place? Remember the five, five wise virgins? Where did they go in? They went into the marriage, right, with Jesus. They went into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary by faith. They went into the marriage. And the reason why Jesus told the foolish virgins, and then here again, I don't know you. The word know means it, it describes an intimate relationship in marriage the word no because in Genesis 4 1 remember it says Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived very intimate relationship between man and his wife so when Jesus said I don't know you it means we are not married 
you chose not to enter them into the most holy place. You chose not to marry me. That's why he says, I don't know you. You're not my bride. So, what these people who are going to be lost, they fail to enter in by faith into the marriage. And Paul describes the same thing. How do we enter into this place, the marriage, the most holy place? Let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. This is the key in being ready for the close of probation. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. The Bible says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. The holiest place, the most holy place, where Jesus is our high priest, we're told to enter boldly because Jesus died for us. With his blood, he made his way open so we can enter. And the Bible says it's a new and living way, but yet, at the same time, it's a straight and narrow way. You know why? Because it takes self-denial to enter into the most holy place. If you know the sanctuary message, you have to go through the courtyard. We have to confess, repent of our sins, die to self at the altar of sacrifice. We have to give ourselves up as a living sacrifice. And when you enter the holy place, you have to partake of manna, the word of God, and receive the oil of the Holy Spirit. Remember the seven golden lamps? And then you have to go to the altar of incense to pray. And then you can, by faith, enter the veil into the most holy place, the secret place. See, the sanctuary message is not a very popular message, even in Adventism. People think, oh, it's kind of boring. People are not interested in sanctuary message. And it takes a lot of faith to enter in the most holy place because it's by faith only. See, the marriage, the wedding with Jesus and his church has been going on since 1844, becoming one with Christ until the close of probation. And if you're not there at that time, it's too late. It's too late to enter. But those, who, those of us who cho choose to enter the most ho holy place now are going to stay there after the cl probation closes. Because remember David says in Psalm 27 verse 5, For in that time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me. Just like God hid Noah and his family in the ark, safety of the ark, we're going to be hid by faith in the most holy place after the close of probation. We're going to be kept safe. But if you choose not to enter in by faith now, it will be too late at that time to enter. Jesus says, I don't know you. I don't know you. So how are we going to enter and watch and wait? <coughs> if you go back to Hebrews 10, three things Paul mentions. Three things. Verse 22. Let us Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That's the first thing. 
Okay, drawing near with faith and being washed with pure water, water of the Holy Spirit. But there's one catch to this. We all, all always talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, put something in Hebrews 10 because we're going to come right back to it. But let's turn a few pages over to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Do we see the marriage here? Union between Christ and his church. And then verse 26, That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Yes, the water represents the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit works through the medium of the Word of God, Scriptures. We can't just, just pray, oh, please cleanse me, cleanse me, cleanse me, without really going to the Scriptures, because it's the Word of God that has the power. And the Holy Spirit works through the Scriptures to cleanse our hearts. Remember the ten virgins? They all had the lamp. But one group didn't have the oil. So you need both the lamp, which is the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit, the oil, to have our hearts cleansed. And then verse 27, that he might present it. It means the church now, his bride. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Remember what Jesus said? Those that are holy, be holy still. There will be two groups of people. Okay, so his church, who is married to Christ, will be holy. Now, if you go down to verse 31, Paul describes the marriage again. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is the principle of marriage. Leave what was the former association. You leave your father and mother. And then in Genesis um, account, it says cleave unto the wife. Leave and cleave. That's marriage. We have to leave world, worldliness, our former associations, and then cleave to Jesus, new association with Christ. Now, talking about marriage, someone asked me a question. Well, Mari, but I have never been married. I've always been single. I can't understand the concept of marriage because I don't have the experience. Now, to answer that question, see, even Paul, who wrote about this marriage, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he never married. He was a single man. What about Daniel? And his, his three friends, they are not married either. And Jeremiah, the prophet, in fact, God told him, don't marry and have a family. They're all single men, but they knew the Lord. They loved the Lord. They could have that close, intimate relationship with God. Another person asked me this question. While being married to Christ, I'm a man, and Christ is a man. It might be easier for you ladies to say, oh, I'm being married to Christ. But it's hard for me as a man. If you look at all those great prophets, if you go down Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith, 
You see people like Abel and Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. I mean, these are all male. Man, they could have that intimate relationship with God. So it's not a matter of if you're single or married or if you're a male or female. It transcends that kind of uh, earthly human concept. It's above that, this close, intimate union with God and His people. Anyone can experience that intimacy, that love, that devotion. Words cannot describe. You can only experience that, that intimacy with the Lord. So this is the marriage, and Paul calls, in, calls this marriage between Christ and his church in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. It's hard to understand. How can it be? We're going to be marrying Jesus, coming together as one flesh? It's hard to understand. That's why going into the marriage, going into the most holy place. It's a straight and narrow way. Not people, not many people will have that faith to go in into the marriage. Okay, let's go back to Hebrews 10 as we kind of um, sum up what we have studied this morning. Okay, go back to Hebrews 10, verse 23. Okay. Remember, three things Paul admonishes us to do. The first one was, let us draw near, right? Verse 23, it says, let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. We have to hold on without wavering to all the promises that God has given us. We have to trust and depend on him. Yeah, that's what we need to do. And then the third thing in verses 24 and 25, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. We need to encourage one another, stir up love and good works, and that's why we're here, right? Together, studying the last day events because we see the day approaching, coming closer and closer. We saw today from the parables of Jesus that the close of probation comes suddenly, silently, unnoticed when we're least expecting. But can we know when it's near? Does God give us signs? Yes. Remember what happened in the day of Noah? Before the door of the ark shut, was there a sign given to the people? Remember the animals that came into the ark? Unclean animals, two by two, and the clean animals, seven by seven. Wow, can you imagine? Seeing that miracle, it's a supernatural event. There's no way that's going to happen. But divine intervention, divine sign that there is a God. And yet the people brushed it away. They are still unrepentant. And when the door shut and the rain came, if you read Patriarchs and Prophets, page 100, you know what people did after the, the door was shut and the rain came? Some went up to the ark. They clung to the ark and cried, please, please, let me in, let me in. Some tied themselves 
and their children to some big, powerful animals, thinking that this animal will be strong enough to climb up and be safe from the flood. Others tie themselves to tall trees, thinking that that would save them. And some ran up the high mountains. But every effort they made was too late, was too late. No matter they they're weeping and crying for help, it was too late. Now, in the end, God is going to give another sign. Just like the animals that came into the ark, we are going to see in our nation the church and the state coming together to form the image of the beast. Many Americans would say, oh, that's no way. This country is a, a country of freedom, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech. That's no way. But that is going to happen. Just like the animals coming in, no way. That's a sign that there is a God, that his words will be fulfilled. Even the disciples 2,000 years ago saw many miracles and signs that Jesus was the Messiah. In fact, Jesus explained to the disciples the last day events connected with his crucifixion. But do you know what happened to the disciples when it really happened? I'm just going to read from Great Controversy 594. This, it says, The words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds. And when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. And then she ties that with the future. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they had never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation, and the time of trouble will find them unready. Did you catch that? The events connected with the close of probation? That's what we have been studying the last seven months or so. The last day event series. All the events we've studied from Sunday law, light of rain, loud cry, the judgment of the living, the seal of God, and today the close of probation. These are the, all the events connected with the close of probation. Are we going to hold on to these ev truths? Are we going to are we going to forget them, like, like the disciples? And then connected with the close of provision is the blotting out of sin, which we will study the next time we get together, and character perfection, and 144,000. Those things come in a package. Actually, they all happen about the same time as the close of provision. But each one is a very big theme. That's why we have to separate them into each study subject. See, Satan is watching to catch away every impression, we're told. Because he knows that over 6,000 years of salvation history is coming to an end. When the eternal destiny of every single person living on this earth will be decided. So it's his last chance to deceive and destroy. And if you notice, each time we get together to study the last day events, we find that there's a lot of confusion, a lot of misconception and misunderstanding, and even indifference. Unfortunately, people are not interested to study the last day events. 
Because Satan is working very hard to really snatch away this truth. So, in conclusion, the close of probation is a great dividing line between mercy and no mercy, between eternal life and eternal death. And it's up to us to decide which way we're going to go. If we are unready at the close of probation, we'll be forever too late. There's no second chance. So the focus of our daily life is to live each day as though it were the last day. Because when we die, that's the end of probation, right? And we don't know when that's going to happen. Look at the world. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are. Life can end in a moment. People are being mowed down like grass. No wonder the Bible says people are grass. Our life is like thin air. So we need to live day by day. Because the Bible says today is a day of salvation. So today, let us, by faith, enter in at the straight gate, into the marriage, in the most holy place, to be one with Jesus. But then we need to leave everything behind. We can't cherish our old habits and sins. We need to leave and then cleave to Jesus Christ because only he can save us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the lessons that you have taught us through the parables of Jesus. Thank you that Jesus has really repeated over and over so that we will not miss the important vital truth that he has for us. Thank you for your love, for your patience, for your mercy. Lord, help us, give us the power to really live what we profess so that we will be ready and help others to be ready for your coming. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.